All right, before we get started, I want to make sure that everybody knows our hashtags tonight are hashtag LIS502 and hashtag iSchoolRU. And so I know you're going to be inspired by our speakers, and I want you to share their wisdom on Twitter and whatever other social networks that you use. I also want to thank uh, Lisa for generously supplying our snacks. And also we're joined tonight by um, RUTV and the Targum. So this is great. And so the word that uh, we spread here will continue to be heard beyond tonight. Um, Henry Kissinger once said, there cannot be a crisis next week. My schedule is already filled. <laughs> we don't plan for trouble. Um, we, in, our, in your classes, um, up till now, we try to balance theory and practice. And some of your courses sway more one way than another. Tonight we're going to be talking about when practice and values meet crisis. When they meet the everyday life of your library community. It's about all the times that you will need to take a stand and make a decision. It's about who you are and what you will do. When I was 25 years old, I was promoted to the branch manager of a busy branch of the Free Library of Philadelphia. I walked into a changing neighborhood with growing racial issues, a building project with a general manager and an architect, and I didn't even know what a soffit was. <laughs> this may sound familiar. A neo-Nazi group politely handed me a form requesting meeting room space. A small group of patrons demanded we withdraw James Baldwin's books because they weren't relevant to our community. A serial arsonist wandered the avenue randomly setting fires to buildings, including the firehouse. And more recently, as a school librarian, a student brought his suicide to school with a semi-automatic weapon and took his life in front of our glass library doors. I had to make decisions, and I replay these scenes in my head all the time. I knew that my actions made a difference, but in some cases, I wish I had made a stronger and better and smarter decision. I wish I had done more planning. Our very special panelists tonight had to balance frictions and values, the safety of their staff, the needs of their community, and the library values that are so much a part of their professional practice. They had to address social justice. And so let me introduce the very special guests we have here tonight. First, we have Scott Bonner. <laughs> Scott's dream job was to be the director of a small, independent library and serve a community. So when the library director job in Ferguson opened up, he applied and he was hired. At that point, he was the only full-time li full employee of Ferguson Library, and he was on the job for merely five weeks when on August 9th, unarmed teenager Michael Brown was shot and killed by a Ferguson police officer. The tragic event spread, uh, sparked widespread rioting and civil unrest, plunging the small town into chaos, and it was on the international stage as a flashpoint for social justice in the United States. So with his community in crisis, Scott's actions got the world thinking about libraries and community engagement. They thought about, we talked about library as a safe harbor, and the role of the librarian in bringing a community together to think and talk about peace. One of the things that Scott did was he developed a school for peace in August of 2014, when the school district announced that it would be closed for a whole week. He turned the library into an ad hoc school, serving over 200 students a day. Scott's a recipient of Library Journal's 2015 Movers and Shakers Award for Community Building. He was recently suggested, suge selected as a recipient of the second annual Lemony Snicket Award, uh, Prize for Noble Librarians Faced with Adversity. <laughs> And uh, 
Well, there's, there's a whole bunch of awards. Scott, you should talk about some of them. <laughs> well, in, a, in, a recent, in a recent interview, Scott, Scott said, do not wait for trouble to come to you before you make plans for trouble. When Michael Brown was shot, I hadn't made contact with most of the service providers and nonprofits in my area. I had to do it on the fly. When a tornado, then in, if a, well, I'm sorry, if it would be useful for any library director to learn about available services to make an initial contact, to do a contact, to do a little programming with the, them, so when you, to start working together, then if a tornado hits or whatever, you know where to go. At ALA Annual in San Francisco, um, he polled his audience on how they would respond uh, before sharing his own decisions and, and shared that he wasn't convinced that all of his decisions were right ones. He said, welcome to the land of missed opportunities. He concluded with parting words, be true to yourself in your profession. In other words, be a normal librarian. And Scott received a standing ovation at ALA. Carla Hayden is the CEO of the Enoch Pratt Public Li uh, Free Library in Baltimore, Maryland. Prior to coming to Baltimore, Dr. Hayden was the first deputy, deputy commissioner and chief librarian of Chicago Public Library. She's an assist, she, assistant professor in the School of Library Information Science. She, she had been at the University of Pittsburgh and the library services coordinator at the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. She's an active member of, of ALA and was selected president for the 2003-2004 term. Uh, she served as the immediate past president for the 2004-2005 term. Um, Carla was thrown into the center of crisis uh, when the death of 25-year-old Freddie Gray in police custody sparked massive protests against police brutality. Some of them were violent. She was at the epicenter of the protests at the Pennsylvania branch of Baltimore's Enoch Pratt Free Library, just across the street from the CVS drugstore that burned while being looted on April 27th. Through it all, the, there was a decision for the library to stay open, or re, a decision that received a lot of attention. In an interview with Dr. Hayden, she was proud to say that the library had been open the whole time during the crisis. The library has been the community's anchor. It's the heart of the community at good times and bad times. She also said, I knew that the libraries are community resources. I knew that they are anchors in so many communities. And in a lot of communities like Baltimore, especially challenged ones, we are the only resource. If we close, we're sending a signal that we're afraid or that we aren't going to be available at time when times are tough. We should be especially, we should be open especially when times are tough. I didn't hesitate. My only hesitation was to tell my 83-year-old mother, who is here tonight, that I was going down to the epicenter. But because she was a social worker in Chicago, her, her response was, okay, make sure you have coffee and take water for the people and don't forget the cups and napkins. <laughs> <laughs> We're also gonna be joined tonight by our very own Nancy Chronic, who teaches here at Sky and conducts special projects for Rutgers University Libraries. Nancy has also been president of the American Library Association, focusing on the role of libraries and democracies. She is a tireless advocate for free and open access to information and has spoken out against censorship, filter, filtering, secrecy, privatization, and other attempts to limit public's information rights. Oh my God, there's so much about Nancy we could share. Uh, she's testified several times before Congress, attending annual legislative days at the state and national levels, and participated in several White House conferences and congressional briefings. She's the 2015 recipient of ALA's Ken Haycock Award for the promotion of librarianship. And I want to make sure that you all know that Nancy is currently developing and will be teaching our new course in community engagement that will be um, running in spring 2016. So please consider registering for that course. And, there, and next, we have also our own Mirida Morales, who is one of our PhD students and an ALA Spectrum Scholar. 
Merida, please join us. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, hi, thank you for inviting me to present today on the Spectrum um, program. I'm going to assume that the PowerPoint there is here. Yeah. So I should just be able to click. Yep, there we go. Thank you. Um, I've been asked to present on a project that the Spectrum scholars, that the current cohort of Spectrum fellows has been working on for the past year and a half. Uh, the name of the project is the Social Justice Collaboratorium. But before I get into that project, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on the Spectrum program itself. The ALA, um, a handful of years ago, set up a program to recruit more diverse LIS faculty. Um, and one of the ways that they identified of doing that was to recruit into PhD programs students of color with the assumption that when we graduate we will be hired hopefully by a faculty um, in LIS. Uh, I think the underlying um, the foundation there is that we emulate what we see as an opportunity and um, when students don't see themselves represented in their leadership in their professorate they're less likely to see that as an opportunity for themselves. Um, and so that's what we, I think, represent. The, when we all came together a few years ago at the Elise Conference in Philadelphia, the incoming Elise president, Dr. Clara Chu, had determined that her conference theme for the following year would be social justice in LIS. So she came and spoke to us as a cohort and asked if we would take on the project of creating a social justice tool for LIS to encompass practitioners, faculty, students, um, and activists and community members who are interested in the intersection between LIS and social justice. Um, and we all uh, agreed to take this on and to explore what such a tool might mean for, um, for this for this purpose. Uh, and one of the things that we identified as a potential model for something like this is a, an online collaboratorium. Uh, the collaboratorium has been identified as a way to bring together knowledge um, across a disparate field, or not a disparate necessarily, but a, a very diverse and uh, geographically dispersed field where knowledge resides in different centers and people are very far apart. And so collaborating may seem difficult. Um, and so what happens a lot in, the, in several different disciplines, like the sciences and like Elias, is that a lot of activity on, the, on very similar issues is happening in silos. Um, and there's not a very sus strongly sustained network between these efforts where someone may be able to learn from another group on a model that's been working and how to incorporate it into their own uh, profession or their own practice, their own community and things like that. Um, so we have envisioned this to be primarily an online resource that connects people primarily in, across different areas. Um, so we'd like to make sure that there is a point of entry for activists for librarians, for students and future professionals, for um, LIS faculty, um, act, researchers, scholars interested in social justice and LIS and looking at what social justice means in LIS specifically, whether that's in an MLIS program, a course, um, a community outreach program, whether it's in um, the type of research that LIS does at the academic level um, and even at the community level. So we've identified a, a, a number of different, um, I would say, content areas for the tool. And a few months ago, at the beginning of the summer, we held a symposium, a design symposium at the University of Maryland. And we invited about 40 individuals in LIS um, to come and help us hash out what this tool, how this tool would work 
um, how it might be useful for people who are actually doing this kind of work and who want to be able to communicate with others doing similar work or new work in that same area. Um, so we had, I think, around 36 people were able to attend, which was pretty amazing. Um, and it was um, people from the ethnic caucuses of LA came, um, librarians from what we consider like pretty remote areas of the United States, people who really have a need for these kinds of models, and they know, and they know this, and they may be doing it on a, on a different kind of scale, um, but need tools and need to be able to, for instance, access you know, the right vocabulary sometimes, um, reading lists, how to do collection development for certain types of communities and things like that. Um, so it was really empowering to see this uh, group of people from different areas of LIS who all came together for this one, um, in this, with this one common thread across all of their work. Um, to identify how this tool should start, how it should, uh, what the stewardship of it should look like, um, how it should be hosted, and how it should be um, described to the profession and to faculty so that it's a useful, community-led and community-developed <laughs> tool that helps us um, to bring in new people into uh, social justice work in LIS, but also foster collaboration among different practitioners and scholars. Um, so that's all I have to say. The last thing I will say is that you can actually, if you're interested, we are in the stage of identifying two main aspects of the work, uh, a, a site to host um, the Social Justice collabor Collaboratorium, as well as content um, from the community on models, on policies, on issues, um, on best practices, curriculum, um, recruitment, and that, those kinds of things. So uh, if you're interested, please get in touch with us. Uh, we're available uh, via email, um, via Twitter, and we all have a channel on Slack. So if you are interested in working and collaborating with us, um, send us an email and we'll give you an account on which to sign up and start contributing your own content for the site. That's all I have. Thank you. All right, next up we're going to have just a, a couple of uh, opening remarks for, um, from both Scott and from Carla. I think, Scott, you're going to go first. Is that right? Sure. Um, so my plan is just to give you a rough idea of what we did um, in response to uh, the, the crisis in, in Ferguson. Um, first off, the nature of the crisis is a long-term one. It was uh, ongoing over, it's really still ongoing, but uh, you know, the, the hot parts that ended up in the news were ongoing over you know, five, six months. Um, and it was rising and falling action. So this, and it was a situation that was uh, you know, politically divisive and personally divisive for a lot of people. Um, and it was something that had, you know, it involved different kinds of crises in the community. There was an uh, 18 year old young man being shot, uh, which caused a lot of shock and anger. And there was uh, ongoing protests over the long months. And there was, um, during the hotter times, there was looting. Um, and understand, there's a difference between protesting and looting and rioting, right? And there are at least two nights, I think, that I would say that there was rioting. Um, and so this is an ongoing issue. It gets hot, it gets cool, it, it gets into waiting mode, there's tension, then it gets hot again, um, and then there's a lot of problems. And our response to that ongoing issue was to just do what libraries do, right? We are part of a long tradition of libraries that step up when their communities need them, whether that is a flood, or a tornado, or a shooting incident, or anything else. And so we did what libraries do. We tried to identify what the problems were and found every way we could to help. Um, specifically, I kind of made a decision early on that I wanted to uh, do everything I could think of, and I wanted to say yes to all the other great ideas that I heard, 
I wanted to look back at that time and regret saying yes too much rather than regret saying no too much because I knew it was going to go sideways and there were going to be things that, that went wrong and I was going to be overwhelmed and things were going to be goofy and that was okay as long as I you know, felt like we did all that we could. So we did a lot of things. Uh, I'll give you a few highlights just to give you a contact or an idea of what we were up to. Um, there was the School for Peace, which none of us knew was called School for Peace until it was done the School for Peace. Um, that name came later. I remember every night we'd do this planning thing, getting ready for the next day, and every night I'd be like, okay, people, I'm on social media trying to draw people to this. Do we have a name yet? Is there a name for this thing yet? <laughs> no, there never was. Until a couple weeks later, and then suddenly there's a name. Thanks. Anyway, um, so we did the School for Peace, um, and we did... Uh, hosted the Small Business Administration that provided emergency loans for businesses that had been broken into. Uh, we provided um, a space for like uh, the state insurance agency to work out of, for uh, the vital documents to work out of. We provided a place for groups like NAACP and ONUS and uh, Ferguson Forward and some other groups to work out of to do the work that they have to do. Um, and we provided all kinds of kind of more specific programs. Basically, for a long time there, uh, every time I had a conversation with anybody, that conversation was, was a conversation about programs. They would introduce themselves, hi, I'm you know, so-and-so, I manage the bank over here, and within two minutes I'm like, okay, so it's going to be a financial literacy program, it's going to happen once a quarter, it's going to be at 7 p.m. on the second Wednesday of every month, that kind of thing, because you know, just saying hello to me was, a, was asking to become a programmer, or to run programs. And so we just did a whole lot. Now, I don't know if we did the right thing, because if you're doing a whole lot, that means that you're doing a whole lot of things, and there are a whole lot of other things that get lost. We were the free world was calling us and saying, "Hey, um, can we can we come do things with you?" And I said yes to everything. And my nightmare is that someone wanted me to go back and read my emails from August and September of last year, and I will see all the awesome, awesome things that we didn't do because I was too busy running around doing the things we did do. Um, and so that's like the brief overview. And then, I would gladly go into any and all specifics, but I think I need to give some time to my hero, Dr. Hayes. Oh, no. <laughs> no, because I just want to thank the school, too, for uh, allowing me to finally meet Scott in person. We have missed each other at conferences, and the highlight of the day after when we decided to open that library that's right on the corner. The real hero from the prep library is Melanie Towson Diggs, the branch librarian. But the highlight was when the phone rang and it was, and there's everybody said, the people from Ferguson are calling us. <laughs> Yay, there was this solidarity thing and it just gave the staff such a lift to get that call and it meant so much to us um, at that time because we knew that we were a library community in it together. And that whenever we were setting a pattern almost, and that yep. whatever was happening in the, the country, and unfortunately there was starting to be a pattern there. Like eight or nine months later, after Ferguson, Baltimore happened. And it was quite uh, an experience because Baltimore um, had had some tensions and, and actual demonstrations that people remembered from 1968 in this same neighborhood. And you could see the residue of the 1968 riots and, and your distinction between protesting and rioting was very, and looting. Uh, and so this area had been boiling or, or simmering for a long time. And the library, that library branch had been a beacon in the community for many, many years. And it just received a makeover, renovation. And it had, it's right on the corner where everything happened. So it was great space. And it had two, and it has two story uh, glass windows. And we had just renovated and put in our graphic designer, graphic jack, we call them. Uh, said, we, I want to monumentalize a young African-American child reading on those glass uh, windows. And there was a little nervousness, 
you're going to do that, and it, for that, it, it hadn't been uh, defaced or anything. And so when Mulaney, uh, there were a couple of days that things were going, but that one, um, April 27th, and just like you remember the date, it's All the date. dates are burned into my memory. You, you remember the date. Um, April 27th was when the real, and we are calling it the unrest, uh, started. And Mulaney could see right out of those big windows during the day a lot of people just gathering and being air agitated. And then finally about the early afternoon, late afternoon, she saw a group of people running. And there were children after school on Monday and other patrons in the library. And so she called to uh, my office and said, you know, what, what should I do? She said, lock the doors and keep people in. She then uh, later let people leave the back door and ushered them out and got them out. But then that night she called me and I must admit I was a little nervous because as a director sometimes you don't want to always direct. <laughs> You want to, especially when people know their neighborhoods, they know their libraries and branches and, and that. And, and so I didn't know if she was going to say, you know, I think we should close, things are too hot. They didn't do anything to the library, but staff was afraid. But what she said was, I want to open. The community expects us to be there. We've been there. And I just said, all right, the lady, all right, we'll be there. And in fact, all the other librarians, other people from all over the library volunteered to come. My only apprehension, and I did, and no matter how old you are, you do have sometimes that fear of a parent that had been instrumental in your life. And so I did wait until about right when I was leaving the next morning with the with the other staff to tell my mom that I was going. <laughs> <laughs> Last minute. So she couldn't say anything. Um, and that's when she gave me her thing. And then by that Thursday, she was there passing out at the information desk as a volunteer, <laughs> <laughs> passing out apples, seeing there, seeing it, and put her back into that social. But that gets into the values of the social service and that. And the staff members were uh, truly uh, remarkable. And to see the other staff from all over the library system come and volunteer so that those. Uh, staff members who from that branch could be there. And we became the center. We were the only place that had bathrooms, yep. restrooms, the only place, and we started handing out water. Uh, the media didn't have any place to go to plug in their things, <laughs> and so that helped in terms of media attention. <laughs> we saw all of them, we said, there goes so and so, everything. And it was quite intense, but what came out of it was the the idea of the partnerships, people, the Small Business Association, one of the first, legal aid, uh, giving workshops on legal issues, and all of the things that came out of it, plus that we know that all of our branches need to be prepared in that. So it really, um, the partnership even carried over until with donations, and both libraries received. Uh, Significant donations. Significant yes, uh, donations from the Andreessen's uh, founder of Netscape. True. And that was who was watching the different things on TV and heard about libraries and said that his small town library was his salvation. And when he heard about the Ferguson Library and then the Baltimore Library, he donated uh, computers and things. So. Computers to each of us, yes. Yeah. We did try to figure out. Who had what? Right, right. As soon as I heard the, I saw the news report saying $170,000 worth of computers to these two libraries. I said, okay, where's my list? How much did he, how much did I get? How much did they get? And on our side, <laughs> our tech guys were doing the same thing. So, uh, uh, so we've had this, this uh, partnership, but it, it, it really has renewed. And I know that sometimes you can get in management, you can get so far away from what you got into it for. And being at that place, watching the community, being with the staff, uh, really renewed my sense of mission. And uh, I have the luxury of being in an independent library, so I was at ground level, and I was the you know, um, because our library is very independent. It's not a sub. It's not a piece of the city. It's independent from the city. 
we have our own tax base or get our own tax money, that kind of thing. And uh, I don't answer anyone in the city and then one city answers to me. And I'm not part of a big system. Um, and I was brand new to the job. I was like naive and young. And so uh, I was able to get away with a whole lot because I was able to say yes whenever I wanted to essentially. Um, and my board was, was behind me. And so we got to take a lot of action, do a lot of things, make dumb things, so that's, that's fine. Um, uh, precisely because I was uh, was so independent, mm -hmm. and uh, for me, you know, since running an independent library is my dream job, I was just coming into my you know great hopes for the for the profession and and into my spirit for the profession that kind of thing, and so it was a uh, fulfillment for me rather than a reminder. Right, and the longer you're in the profession, you need the reminders. You need to. Uh, I don't want it that way, though. <laughs> no, and, and but you don't. But it's interesting that you don't want it that way. But that's when you really see the values, uh, mm -hmm. and that there's still a core of values, no matter what else is going on, uh, that is there. Right. So, um, if it's okay if I ask you some questions. Um, I, one thing that stood out when you were talking just now was that. Uh, the, the news cameras couldn't find a plug. Right. Um, what was your approach to the media? Well, we have a very um, active um, and young and energetic communications director who was right there uh, tweeting and carrying on <laughs> uh, and updating people mainly to let them know all of our libraries were open, not just the one there, but all of the libraries were open. And so what happened was he actually knew that they needed that type of thing in some of them. And so we became, our story room in that branch became the story room. And they were interviewing people and bringing them in. Oops, he said that a space for the meeting? Well, we had the story room. Oh. And so, and while we were uh, handing out food and Whole Foods came in and started bringing food, we were a distribution, um, place for things like diapers because the stores weren't open. Yep. So people couldn't get basic supplies. So we had the, the meeting room was that, and then when the kids were out of school, we set up the Wii machines and had all kinds of gaming, and, and it just became the community center. So with the media, they were just really pleased, but there were, there were stories right in front of their faces. And so <laughs> yeah. they would just say, well, why are you here? It's a safe place. It's the only yeah. place. And it, so it was interesting to see that because a lot of the media people were discovering libraries again. Yes. You mean you yes. give programs? How many times <laughs> I hear that? Oh my goodness. Did you hear oh, that yeah, a lot? Absolutely, absolutely. I had never thought of a library doing this. Really? And <laughs> we're, we're talking like, about a program that we do like every week. Right, right. Okay, <laughs> so yes, we have expungement classes. We have people that come in and do that. Yes, we, we have a free Wi-Fi. <laughs> uh, teachers come in with classes. And, so it was interesting because they were, did you find, you found oh, that yeah, with the media? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and uh, we got to see local media, national media, international media, and they all had very different ideas of what a library is all about. Um, I wish we'd had a space to fit them up in. Because right. they did most of their interviews in the 300s. Right. <laughs> right. right down that aisle. Got right. to that book. But look at the coverage and look at the... Well, know, I know. I know. It was the, great. The books were in the background. So um, for media, media was strange with us because um, I had been... So the, the, the first day of School for Peace, right? Um, this is a wonderful story of cynicism in action. Um, but the first day of School for Peace, we're out there on the street sign with, uh, on the sidewalk with signs saying school here, bring your kids into school at the library, and a guy with a gigantic camera walks up, right? And some massive, I don't know which organization he was with, but he had a massive, massive camera. And he walks up to me, straight to me, probably because I was the one in the tie, mm -hmm, uh, walked up straight to me and he said, we've had a week of bad stories, it's time for a turn, need a good story, you're it. Okay, and it was just this wonderfully cynical thing that resulted in lots of good for the library. We happened to be there doing a good thing That's when right. they needed a good thing to talk about. And That's so right. I immediately went inside and, and you know, uh, uh, emailed some of the fellow directors that I know and said, 
you know, oh my God, what do I do? Because no one had ever, ever at any point told me anything about dealing with the media, right? And my fellow they don't teach you in library school. No, no, there was nothing about dealing with the media in library school. And my fellow directors, basically they had one or two bits of advice, but the bulk of their advice was, watch your butt. <laughs> you know, because they'll eat you alive. Um, and, I, and I rather foolishly took the total opposite tack, and I, I, I played guard door, guard at the door, like a like guard dog at the door, and told, you know, you read them the riot ad, you can't take any pictures of any human faces without their permission. If it's a child, you need the parents express permission. Uh, don't, I made this one up on the fly, and I, I love it. Don't take a picture of someone checking out a book where they have the picture of the face and the picture of the book in the same frame. Very good. Because it violates good. freedom, like freedom, freedom, freedom. freedom. Yeah, intellectual freedom right there. That kind of thing. So I'd stop them at the door and I'd play the, play the tough guy, right? Grr, 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 can't do this, can't do that, right? But I'd always let them in. And it worked out really, really well because it was to their advantage to make us have good stories. <coughs> and every time they showed up, it happened to be when we were doing something good and they wanted a good story. And so it always worked to our advantage. And because of that, that's why you even know who we are. Right. The difference between what we did and what libraries do every day and what every library does in a crisis is cameras, right? right? And so we were able to leverage that and you know get crazy on social media and that kind of stuff. It resulted in lots of uh, lots of good press, which resulted in people knowing that we were there, which resulted in people coming in and getting the services that we were there to offer, which was beautiful. It also resulted in lots of great donations. And the donations came from all over. Yeah, the uh, we had we got so my <laughs> I always put this in context because. Because I, I always imagine that there's people that come from libraries with million dollar budgets and they'll be like, oh, you got a few donations? We have a budget of about 400K a year. We got donations of 450K in November and December. So, wow. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's the, that was the rise and fall of the thing. We don't get those kind of budgets anymore. <laughs> um, but we got huge donations and it was, uh, it's beautiful and it's made a whole lot of things possible that had not been possible for a very long time. Our library had, before I started, had become you know, you always talk about the book warehouse. Uh, my predecessor had watched her budget drop from 600K to 400K over the space of like three years and had cut full-time positions, reduced the number of hours, stopped on programming, that kind of thing. And I was hired in part because I was willing to try and build this up back up without any budget to do it. And the donations were also in terms of time, people coming in and saying, we'll, we'll help the kids after school and tutor. Um, and just coming in with, I uh, mentioned those baskets of uh, apples, but just other things to help. And one lady made sure that the information desk always had fresh flowers just to brighten up when she came uh, just to do something for staff. One thing that I learned in, in this process is that one of the core duties of the library in times of crisis is to provide a way for people to help to just say yes when they come in and say, can I help provide something to, for them to do in any which way you can because that's something that people need, right? Our, our particular issue was very divisive and it divided the community, but it also caused a wellspring of need to get together and form as a community and do things together. And so a lot of the things we had tons of volunteers because that was a way for them to do something good for their community and that's one of the things the library has to do is be there say, yes, we can help you be a better person. Right, and when you're in the midst of that type of international uh, view of a community that people live in and it's negative and they're seeing it, uh, they want to show people that yeah. the community is not just that. No, that's that a, it's a burning desire in Ferguson is to, is to redeem that reputation. Right. So, um, your story is not that different from Marada's story. We are all talking about how you're building community, either a community, a collaboratory online, your work building, bringing people together, building community. Tell us about a year later and, and, what, and what's still there, what continues, and what's different. Um, a year later, it's a mixed story and a complicated one. Um, there are a lot of people who are pushing and pushing and pushing for changes um, uh, in well, the way the police do their policing and community relations and race relations and that kind of thing. Um, but there's a real question, 
I think, as to whether or not all of this talk and all of this fervor will actually result in any meaningful change. Will there be a shift in how, how the police department actually works or in how the communities, the white community and the black community interact with each other and that kind of thing. And, you know, there are, I like to say that in Ferguson there are two sides of the story, there are 51 sides of the story. And they're not all pulling in the same direction. And so it's complex. That doesn't, it's not as uh, bad as it sounds because in the end we're still a community. We still have a sense of community. We still, you know, everyone still gets up, they, they, they walk to work, they chit chat with each other on the way in and normal, uh, normal life happens. Uh, but will there be meaningful change? I don't know. Um, how much of a, do we have as much of a sense of community as we did before this all happened? Uh, yes and no, right? Because there was already a division there that was revealed. But at the same time, there are all these other new connections going on. So a year later, I'd say it's inconclusive. And that's why I smiled at Scott because we talked about this when we first met today uh, in person and we talked about uh, the fact that uh, unfortunately in those communities, there aren't many visible signs of change and that our, ours is for reason people, so we're still looking, but that is a, there's a sentiment in the community where we don't see anything that's different. And remember in Baltimore, <coughs> they are still looking at things from 1968. When people were coming in after the unrest, they thought that that was new. No, that's been boarded up since 1968. Um, so where they are seeing change and something happening is in the library. More programming, more activity, more people, and so the library has become even more of a. a I think anchor. it's safe to say that we have reset the community's understanding of the library. Right. We went from being, you know, this kind of place with books, and people thinking of the library as that place where they got books when they were a kid, and the lady shushed them, and now we're very much more in the center of the community. We have trouble uh, with scheduling our meeting rooms. We don't have very many. Going to, but we have trouble scheduling them because there's too many people that want them at once, right? Too many different organizations that are still trying to do things through the library. They see the library is the place to do the things we need to do because we're you know, politically neutral, religiously neutral, safe, mm -hmm. everything else. Um, and we are packed full of people. You know, there's a lot of times in the afternoons where there's no place to sit, it's standing room only. Um, and that is radically different than the day that I started. And I think it's not because we're doing things all that differently than every library does, but it's because people are aware of us in the way that they were before. And in the uh, Baltimore situation, the library was the community center. And what the reset was in that city was other entities looking at the libraries that are in all the other communities as community, and as one uh, person said, as opportunity centers. And so it reset the external, uh, outside of the community, the vision, uh, stakeholders, selected officials, and, and things. That's where the reset came. The community counted and protected that library. They stood outside of the library uh, during some of the most tense times and protected Penny, who's that two-story young lady. I remember seeing some of those pictures of the them. Pictures. Oh my God, that's beautiful. Right. But they just stood out there. They stood the out in front of the library and said, no, not here. Yeah, um, I should uh, go back and backtrack a little bit. Um, I'm overstating the case um, for how withdrawn the library was before I started, because it wasn't really that withdrawn. I know that uh, when the tornadoes hit in 2012, the library was the center of activity there uh, for people that were uh, needing a place to recharge and get a drink of water and that kind of stuff while they're waiting for their houses to be rebuilt. And I know that uh, when the tornado, tornado hit, and I think it was 2008, same thing happened. I mean, we've been hit a lot. But uh, so it's not, it's not like we were nothing and now we're something. It's more like people's expectations are changing. They expect, no, they expect the library to be that place. Right. So some of you were talking at the, at the, at the Knowledge Cafe about experiences you had, say, in Hurricane Sandy. So does anybody want to share some similar experiences of how it really, the experience of what the library's role was then really transformed the way the library is perceived now in the community and the way the librarians 
perceive themselves in the community, I think it's fair to say, that you see yourself very differently. I wish I'd known, well, I knew Carlo before, but I wish I'd, I'd known Scott before so I could, could observe the difference. But uh, does anybody else want to share an experience that they had when, uh, when they were working in libraries that went through a disaster? We talked about Hurricane Sandy and what happened and the need to even prepare and have more water in the supply closets and, and to, to do that we, in terms of preparing for the future. And we looked at what happened. There were several libraries uh, that were something during Hurricane Sandy. Well, I think the, li the libraries were doing great things during Hurricane Sandy when we saw Twitter accounts letting us know where gasoline was able to, where, where we were able to buy gasoline. Come and, come and recharge your phone at the library. Come and have heat at the library. But what, I mean, what I'm curious about is, it seems the narrative in New Jersey kind of died down after a couple of months even. That, that, that libraries were the savior of these communities. That libraries were the place where we went to when things went really bad. Um, how are you kind of pushing the, uh, the marketing of us or, or the, or the what happens now? How do, you, how, do you, how do you get people to keep coming to you? Well, Scott has on a wonderful shirt that says Library of the Year. <laughs> <laughs> Which is so, right. so they were named Library Journals, Library of the Year. And he's And he mentioned that when I saw the shirt, I said, oh, that is really cool. They were giving it out to um, community people. And I said, what about hats, too, you know? <laughs> here, um, all of that, lanyards, and a banner, mm -hmm. and putting it on your stationery. Um, right. And really making sure that that, and the reason why you are so being able to keep, keep that interest going um, is important. All the awesome things that happened, uh, support of the library like awards and like uh, donations and book donations that kind of stuff all that has follow-on obligations that we are struggling because we're a small library with a small staff and no budget uh, we're struggling to meet and so we've got the best book donations you could ever imagine in the areas of uh, civil rights civic engagement and uh, recovering from trauma phenomenal phenomenal and we're processing them as fast as we can and we haven't even begun to dent that mountain uh, because we just have one part-time cataloger, right? And we get volunteers every so often that can help us out. But it's still just a big thing. And you know, so we've gotten these awards, and I'm like, oh, I've got, I've got to find a way to capitalize this so we can turn this into more programming for the community and ways to help the community, right? No one ever told me anything about marketing or how to do or, or how to, or anything. We have a list. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's a list. No one ever told me how to do marketing. No one ever told me how to like um, approach a big corporation to see if they can fund a big program or you know how to have those, how to glad hand or anything. I don't want to do any of that stuff. And so I feel like I am desperately treading water trying to find some way to leverage this for the good of my community. And you know, sometimes I'm successful and sometimes I, I, I feel, feel like I'm not. And I really feel like I'm, t com this is true for every bit of this. I feel like I'm totally unprepared and I make it up as I go along, and often it works out. But what he's not really giving himself credit for is he has great instincts, mm -hmm. great values, and he's super smart, and he cares. Mm -hmm. And you put cares. all that together, and you do quite well. Thanks. And he's authentic. So when you're an old right. man, and you're like, oh, okay, you're, you're, so you, you've got it. Thank you. you've got it. So another thing that um, we were talking about earlier is not only does maybe you not get prepared for this kind of marketing, but how do you know how to respond to the media when they come and they just put that mic in your face? You know, Carla got a lot of media training. I got media training because of the, my role in ALA and then my role as a director. In fact, I got additional training because they tell you don't wear stripes and polka dots. 
Right. You, always see people, you always see people on TV with them. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to need your training. Um, and also that you can say, I'll call you back. But all of those things are important when you are preparing or you even have to tell your story. So in our list, and Scott, we, we made a list of things they don't teach you in library school. That was one of the major, um, I put a star by that one. Uh, media relations, board relations. Yes. Uh, you talked about your board. Also, the marketing and fundraising. How do you mm -hmm. ask for right. fundraising? And also, government relations, lobbying. Your budget should increase. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be nice. All of the things that have been going on. Uh -huh. So, there are a lot of things that you. That I'm not prepared for. And I'm <laughs> right. going to have to make it up as I go along. I hope I can figure it out. And the, the media, to tag to your question, was the same way. I no one ever told me how to deal with the media. Um, I am lucky in that what seemed like the obvious thing to do with the media turned out to be the right thing to do with the media, right? After I'd done about 500 interviews, someone finally, because they, they said, oh, you did really well. And I'm like, uh, one of the media people, I'm like, oh, did I? He said, yeah, you know, they, they teach you these things. She rattled off like four things. I was like, oh, thank God, because I've been doing all four of those. You know? <laughs> <laughs> right? Be very direct, be very honest, have a few things that you want to make sure you talk about, um, and uh, be ready for curveball questions. That's so all. I think we have some online questions. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to sure. ask Joyce to join the panel no, here, great. too. And uh, Nancy, we've got a number of uh, online questions again. What we want to do today, tonight, is to have a conversation. Uh, as you notice, we're not PowerPointing you at all. Uh, this is about talking, uh, discussions, so don't be shy and ask your question. And uh, again, Nancy is going to moderate our conversation. Do we have some online questions? We have an online question. Uh, Carrie's asking, how did they deal with security concerns with the threats of violence? and theft during the crisis. I, uh, so why don't we go ahead and repeat the question just so we everyone can hear? How do you deal with security concerns and worries about theft, is that right? Yeah, and during violence. The crisis, and violence during the crisis. Um, I, for me, um, question one, is it safe to open? If yes, then open and do everything you can. Um, so I stayed up to the wee hours of the night watching live streams of what was going on to see how hot it had gotten. I would check out the environment every morning, I would talk to my staff, I would talk to people in the area, that kind of thing. Um, and, you know, with, um, with a couple of exceptions, it was safe every day, and so we were open almost every day. So, for example, the night of the grand jury announcement, the announcement was at, right after we closed, and so we were able to be open all the way to 8 o'clock, but it got so ugly and hot and destructive with, you know, miles of, of windows being broken out. And, a dozen places being burned down that we knew was going to happen again the next night, so we closed at four. So first thing, if safe, we open, right? And then the second thing that I did is I very deliberately did not board up, right? The right. whole town right. boarded up. Yes. Uh, all the businesses up and down the road were, were boarding up their windows because in, in preparation for the uh, grand jury announcement, right, in November, um, and we. We have to welcome the public, and we can't welcome them with a plywood board. We've got to welcome them with human faces. And so I deliberately chose not to board up. And just by chance, it happened to work out that the library never got hit. Um, but, um, and we never got a security guard or anything like that. And that's very much, I didn't feel like we needed to for security reasons. I was willing to sacrifice some windows in order to still be the public's library. And really had to nod uh, with the decision not to board up because I mentioned the two-story windows and there were people on staff advising us we need to board up we need to do that and we just couldn't that was we've been that open place and then what that signal uh, would have been devastating and we did make the decision to close not only that library but all the libraries at 5.30 um, because it was still light out and you could almost feel a change and I know you had that experience in what was happening in the area yep. at about 5 o'clock 
it was uncanny. Yes. <laughs> How Suddenly no you human could tell yep. what was going. So by 5.30, it was safe for the staff, safe for the kids to go home and everything, but it was in the air yeah. that at a certain time, it was that. Yeah, I, absolutely. I, I wonder though, um, the stuff, stuff didn't begin at, at these incidents. You were building community engagement all along, you know, working in various different urban branches. I knew that folks really wanted their library to succeed and, 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 want, and trusted librarians and wanted to protect the space no matter what. And so the history of this starts before those events. That trust is built in advance. And so what, what, did, what did Mulaney and what did you do in advance to connect with your community before these events happened? Um, I was brand new, and so I was still... I know, in those five weeks. <laughs> in those, in those five weeks. I was still sending out emails saying, hi, I'm the new <laughs> library director. Can we meet sometimes so I can tell you how the library can help you? Uh, yeah. So yeah. I was doing but that you know on But to what you, I don't know if it made any difference in, in how the community responded to our crisis because I was so new. But one thing that is true, for, as always, just, it's instinctively true for me is that I have a lot of conversation with individuals and very direct conversations. I'm very much someone who wants to talk to people one on one. And so I think that I was building relationships with, with the regulars in the library well before uh, anything happened. Uh, but I didn't really have time. Well, well you know, I, maybe I did have time to do more preparing. I still think that I should have been calling Operation Food Search from day one to say, hey, can I get to know you? Can we do something together so that they could have been there for me uh, whenever we did the School for Peace? So you have a big Rolodex now. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, actually, I've got, a, uh, I've got an old-fashioned um, filing cap, uh, like a, a index card cabinet, you know, uh, that we used to do the, the, the you know, little cards. Because when I first started, yeah, you know, research. Whenever I started in libraries, we were still using them. There's one of those behind my desk, and one of those drawers is full of cards. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> we still call that community resource or referral mm -hmm. uh, files. I was thinking I of uh, card catalogs. I know, I know. Old fashioned card catalog. Yeah. Yeah. And Melanie had just been there a year. And so she had made an uh, effort to get out in the community. She went to the district command uh, police district meetings, she had been out of the community, and she was there so much um, on the weekends and everything, so they knew her. So we have some more online questions. And we want to make sure we get her. Uh, we'll circle interest. around to some of the other mm -hmm. issues. So. Um, Eric's asking, what is your relationship like with the police following these situations? Have you been able to bring them together with the community? Mm-hmm. Again, we, repeat the question. Oh, uh, the relationship with the police, and have we been able to help? Uh, bring them in with the community. We have been a place where there have been meetings uh, the, with the mayor and the commissioner in our branches and that has been really helpful because it's after things have happened. And we um, had a program that we are accelerating now where we invite the police officers to do story time, to actually oh. have programs in there. There's this great children's book of Officer Buckle and Gloria. <laughs> so you know that one, so Officer <laughs> Gloria and Buckle. Uh, and so what we had found before, we had a thing called Co Coffee for Cops, where we, they could come in and do their reports in the library and things like that. But to have them in the library for things that weren't just about uh, policing and things, about give some workshops on, on safety or whatever. So we, we really tried to make sure that they're part of our library program. We've tried to do a couple of things like that, like to invite them in to do the reports and, and offer coffee and that kind of thing. Uh, they never really went anywhere. Um, for the police specifically, our relationship is um, good, um, but it is not one that's built around programming um, because the few programming ideas I've had haven't really gone very far. Uh, but we do, you know, we, when we need the police, we call the police and, and we have an interaction with the police and, and they've been good with us. Um, as far as uh, the rest of the city leadership, um, 
we're independent. And so they had their own things to worry about. And I think they were spending all their time trying to keep them to deal with their stuff. And so they weren't doing things with the library throughout all of that. Um, and now we, we've uh, have done a number, hosted a number of programs that have involved uh, city leadership. So for example, we're doing um, uh, how to vote, uh, or excuse me, how to run for office uh, program right now. Last week, it was a two-parter. Last week was how the uh, local election system works. This coming week is how to actually uh, file for office, raise money, that kind of thing. Here's the deadline date for this first form, the second form. Here's how to you know, watch your money. Here's how not to get busted by this law about fundraising, that kind of thing. Um, and we've we've had like the mayor come and speak as part of that, and the city council people, and um, school board people, and state representatives, and that kind of thing. Um, if that answers your question. How about we take a question from our live audience? Face-to-face -face audience. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, can we can mic? Oh, I understand. This is Nancy. Uh, my name is Tanya Johnson. Um, I would like to know, um, I come from a legal background. I was a lawyer before I was in um, the master's program here. So I was wondering, I know that as any facility, libraries have to deal with liability issues. So I was wondering if liability concerns uh, played into what your decisions were during all of the turmoil. Hmm. The in, in our instance, there is insurance for um, the public and staff in certain levels in terms of that. And so that we knew we were insured for that type of thing. Um, and of course, for property damage, mm -hmm. you're insured as well. Um, yeah, and we have, a, we have similar insurance. It's certainly against the building and the collection and the computers and that kind of thing and for people getting injured at the library and that sort of thing. Um, but to look a little deeper, um, yeah, the heart of that first decision of whether or not it's safe to be open is a decision of whether or not a patron's going to get hurt or a staff member's going to get hurt. What's the likelihood of that happening? Um, and that's always on my mind, and it was always on my mind throughout everything that was going on. Because um, I don't want to hurt someone. I want to be responsible for hurting someone. And one thing that I realized is that uh, you know when the schools closed for a week straight, yeah. and uh, and we opened school and did the best we could to patch over that gigantic because you know we helped like two hundred some odd kids, the school served like thousands of kids, so we were only a little band aid on this problem. But when the schools closed for a week straight, I didn't criticize because they have a totally different set of concerns. You know everything that I do at the library is voluntary. No one has to go. Right, and so I can think of things a little differently than a school does, where where everyone's compulsory, and and a different level of like personal responsibility for someone getting injured. Any other questions? Yeah. Hi, my name is Chelsea. I'm just here about your TV for the school. Like, what did you guys actually do? Like, what kind of subjects did you guys teach? Like, I as oh. I said, I'm about your TV. I literally know nothing about this. I'm just curious. Okay, um, about the School for Peace, as it was later called. Um, what did we do? Uh, it was started. This is this is the brainchild of uh, of uh, a local um, art teacher, elementary school art teacher, who came in that Monday morning and said, "If I give you some teachers, can you give us some tables and we'll do some tutoring?" It grew so much bigger than that, um, and it was actually our volunteers that ran that thing were teachers that would have been teaching that the school's not been closed. It was a big group of people from Teach for America, because whenever they got word of it uh, through media, they, they sent out like 20 some odd people. And a bunch of volunteers that were like retired teachers, former teacher's aides, that kind of thing. So when we did school, what that meant is when the kid came in and we'd ask him what the grade they were in, and we'd assign that kid to a teacher who had experience teaching that grade, who would give them a real curriculum, right? We're kicking off school. Right, so it was math, it was science, it was and, and grade appropriate for people who knew what they were doing. Right, so I think I think one of the great things about this little school for peace that we did is that those teachers got to teach exactly the way they want to teach, without any hmm. of the hassle of modern schooling to deal with. So boom, <laughs> those kids got it good. <laughs> cool. yeah. Doctor Todd, did you have a question? Yes, um, I was <laughs> wanting to hear from both of you, um, Carla and Scott. 
part of the experience is just, or, or to me would have been, the sheer emotional turmoil. Tell us about the emotional experiences as you live through these extraordinary events. Well, that's when I think about nine-year-old little Christina, who during the week that I was just there, and uh, went back to my children's librarian days, uh, and we stood at the window looking out, and by, the, by you know, three or four days, we were fast friends, okay? <laughs> and um, she's looking and seeing another group of young people just running down the street, and everybody gets tense because they don't know why they're running, and she just said, what's the matter? What, what is this? And looks up at me, and I said, well, sometimes adults don't do so well with the situations. <laughs> Not always what you think. Um, and then to to just see the people coming in with the strollers and, and that. Um, so it does get to, to really get you because yeah. you see the impact it has on the people who actually live in that community. And they, they can't go to get their prescriptions. They can't mm -hmm go to school, they can't go to the grocery store. I mean, their lives have been disrupted, totally. And you see that and you feel it. The, uh, the heart of librarianship, as I conceive it, is empathy. And so there's a lot of emotional response that happens. Um, and, you know, the, the, the story that pops out for me is uh, the, the parent that told me about their little girl. The first, uh, about four of my parents told me this story various times but the first one that told me about their little girl waking up in the middle of the night uh, to find their mother desperately trying to close the windows because there was tear gas drifting across the yard and that just it stings just to even remember that um, on a bigger scale I mean that's very 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 tight to one story but on a bigger scale I don't remember much of August September and big chunk of November right it's all a vague blur in my mind, including all this awesome stuff I already told you about. I'm just kind of vaguely remembering it, <laughs> right? Because um, whenever this kind of thing happens, if you're in a library and it gets hit with some big need in the community, you're going to have 14, 15, 16, 17 hour days. You're going to do them running. You're not going to sit down. You're going to make too many decisions. You're going to have too much to deal with at once. You're going to goof things up. You're going to regret the heck out of a lot of things. That's just the way it goes. Um, and so that's the other piece of it. You have empathy for the people and your own response. And then there's this, this overwhelmingness to the whole thing. Um, also, I now have a Pavlovian response to helicopters. Yes. Whenever I hear a helicopter, I immediately, I, I literally, I physically go, and I start looking at the news and looking around and trying to find out what's going on. Even when I'm like, I'm like, you know, standing on a sidewalk near, near a hospital, so I know exactly what the helicopter is about. I'm still like, mm -hmm. Pavlovian, just no way around it. So what kind of hope do you have for the communities you live in? Is this just stressed communities? You work in distressed communities. Aside from what happened and what you've been doing, what, what's next for your community and what kind of future do you see, and particularly how can the library be part of that future? There is an energy um, and a, a sense that we have to do something. Uh, we have to speak out, we have to take some action, we have to uh, be seen, and just that simmering uh, can sometimes turn into just apathy or you're just defeated and things. So there is a sense of there's this this might be a time that something could happen and maybe we can help that. So there is that that you do sense. Um, I think um, I think our community will come through and I think it's gonna be stronger at the end. I think it has to be because we're a community and we live we're not big enough to be broken forever. Right, and so we have to come through in the end. Um, and I think a lot of that action has happened. A lot of progress has been made. 
Um, but like I said, there's there's real doubt as to what kind of meaningful change will happen, like systematically. Um, I think what I what I want to do as a library is three things. One is I want to give people a voice, right? And so we're doing story core. We're doing a teen written newspaper, that kind of thing, to give people voice that have felt stifled by the media. Like, you know, the media came in, they took my story, they twisted my story, they gave BS to the rest of the world, and then they made money off of it. And I wanted to provide some way for people to tell their story on editing. Two is I want to, like, empower the ability for people to turn this impulse into action. So, for example, with the, I already mentioned that we're doing a how to run for office program. And we did a whole lot of, uh, we allowed different groups, multiple different groups, to do voter registration drives and that kind of thing. Um, and three is we want to have people be able to have a real meaningful conversation. So one of the things that happens in America is we have multiple conversations on race. There's the white conversation, there's the black conversation. They never cross because they're talking about two different things and with totally different understandings. So we started the Readings on Race Book Club. Um, Carla Fletcher started the Readings of Race Book Club at our library, which gets like 20 some odd people. That's a lot of people for a book club. Um, but the whole point is to have people that were having trouble talking to and with each other, because they were talking past each other, to read a book together, which gives a common language. And we've had <coughs> lots of like, life-changing things happen from that little book club, or big book club, and twice on the <laughs> Stacy has another question from the audience, and I want you to think while we ask that next question, what were your takeaways from tonight? And, and maybe share a takeaway before Dr. Todd comes up. So Stacy, what's our next question? Um, it goes back to Scott and the, um, the teachers. Uh, it's two related questions. Uh, what is the relationship like between the libraries and the teachers now? Has it grown stronger? And do you think this freedom to teach could be the start of something new in American approach to education? Hmm. Wow. Wow. Um, for the second thing, freedom to teach, um, as in those teachers being happy because they could teach what they wanted, the way they wanted to teach. Yeah. Boy, wouldn't that be awesome? <laughs> I'm totally pro teacher. I am. I am definitely of the opinion. This is my opinion, not my library's opinion. Thank you. Uh, I am of the opinion that we have professional teachers. We need them professionals, so we should trust them to do their job. Um, but. I can't say that we started anything with a little 200 people <laughs> <laughs> library thing, uh, you know. But that would be pretty awesome if we did. Um, uh, the other part of that question was what? Uh, what is the relationship oh. like between the libraries and the teachers now? Um, we, uh, uh, individual teachers and individual school librarians and individual administrators that I have relationships with. Um, and so I have those contacts and I try, you know, we try to do programming with them. We've done a number of different programs. There were collaborations between individuals from the schools and the library. Um, uh, big programs with the school itself and the library. We've got a number of STEM STEAM initiatives that will hopefully leverage in that way and become something that crosses that border between the school and the library. You know, so the kids aren't just doing school day, day and library at night, but they'll have something that carries from one to the other. Uh, we got ideas, but we haven't really put them all into place yet. What does this mean to you? What are you taking away from our very special guests' conversation? <coughs> They're opening their hearts tonight. Um, what does this mean for you and your library or your future library? What are your thoughts? Yeah. Um, I'm Bella, and uh, my take is that I'm just writing my notes here, so <laughs> they're all jumbled up, but I'm uh, very sure about this to uh, say this to, all, to everybody here that in spite of the limitations, I believe that in spite of limitations in terms of library capacity and staff capability, you uh, you people have fulfilled a mission of the library which is uh, so important and that is social justice and uh, that is my biggest take from here from this uh, conversations that we have been having and that the success criteria and performance me measures that your library is uh, has done has improved the quality of life of communities at the end and I think that really is what matters in the end. And especially that feeling of hope that is generated from this uh, is just amazing. Thank you, Bella. Yeah. Thanks. Beautiful. That's what libraries do. 
<laughs> any any more thoughts before we um, we close up and have Dr. Todd come down? Who else has a takeaway? I have a couple takeaways yes. from the online uh, students. Um, Eric says, my takeaway, events like these help everyone see the core values of a library. So yay for the event. Uh, and Stephanie says, always having a presence gives people a strong sense of security and continuity, which yes. I think is really important as well. So. One more question? Or do you have any? Person? Yeah. Um, they would say a lot of the same things. I'm here for safety, I'm here for shelter. Um, and so I'm thinking about ways that, you know, I don't want a tragedy in Patterson, but I want to be able, I want people to know that we do this every day and not to the great extent, you know, we're open every day, you know, and we serve these people every day. So I'm just thinking about ways that, you know, I can make our library more visible, you know, and, and have that sort of coverage and that sort of understanding. Because it's important that people know that Libraries aren't just important when that happens. Um, can right. I say that uh, a lot of the people, the needs that the most immediate needs that people had during the rough times were the same ones they have every day. I, I need to get a job. Right. Right. I need to, you know, I need to contact my relatives and let them know I'm all right. I do that all the time. Right. Um, also, that the long term issues that libraries deal with mm -hmm. are slow motion versions of acute issues. Right. So we deal with homelessness, which is a long-term version of what libraries deal with whenever a tornado hits, right? And so we learn skills every day that will translate into knowing what to do whenever the, the rough stuff happens. We had a young man that came in that Tuesday morning and said, I'm so glad you're here because I have to apply for a job. Yep. And he came back two days later and he had three job offers. Cool. He came back to tell the library. But That's he was beautiful. So Hello everyone and uh, good evening to our online students as well. I'm just here for one minute to wrap up this wonderful, wonderful evening. Um, many of you know who I am. I'm chair of the Library and Information Science Department. And I just want to say with just deep gratitude uh, to our team here tonight, to you, Carla and Scott, you have such extraordinary schedules and you've taken time out to come to us here at Rutgers and we're deeply honoured mm -hmm. to have you here and to learn in a very, very personal way the, the, the depth of your experiences and indeed your commitment to the profession and of <laughs> course to Joyce and Nancy. It's just a real privilege to have you here. What, uh, and of course Mareda, who is uh, one of our wonderful doctoral students who I have the privilege of working with um, uh, as she continues her studies. You know, what really stood out for me was that libraries as, as integral parts of a community are not merely about information. Your story is about libraries that have a role in sustaining lives, mm -hmm. in the continuity of life, in providing a sense of normalcy, in providing a sense of everydayness, in providing a sense of hope. And I think that's such a really powerful message that has come from you all tonight. And it's just really, really deeply moving for me. But, you know, as what wonderful role models of our profession. What I see here is leadership, of course, but I see real courage. And I see real courage when your own values are challenged and you are caught in a web of tension and struggle and the need to solve problems. And what really came through was the value that you gave to humanity, the very people of your, your towns who needed you to help sustain their lives, to help them deal with the, the difficulties and 
the trouble, the notion of community engagement, the notion of empathy. I think you have remarkable courage. What a wonderful role model for you all, and I hope that it's just been a, a, a great evening for you. One of the really lovely things, too, and I'm glad you play it up, that in this conflict, in these terrible times, and, and the emotional and, and, and mental struggles that you face, you see that through this conflict, you've reset the community's understanding of who you are and what you do and the value that provide. Everyone, please join me in thanking <laughs>